Hey everyone, it's Patch 3.0 in our Crucible, and we are going to talk about the Mage Blood version of Castle and Grave Forbidden Rite. Now, before we go any further, I do want to say that we are going to be under the assumption that you already have a Castle and Grave Forbidden Rite build, or you're pretty familiar with it, and we will not be going over all of the basic things in this guide. If you do want a super, super basic guide on Castle and Grave Forbidden Rite, going over the Ascendancy and Pantheons and leveling and all of the basic information, I will leave in the description my video on the Mage Blood list version of this build, and that should get you started. But we are going to simply be talking about all of the changes that you'd be making moving into a Mage Blood version of this, as well as all the benefits and all the changes that that entails. So why don't we get into it? First up, we should talk about the flasks that we're going to be running with Mage Blood. This allows us to fit in 70% increased effect flasks because Mage Blood makes all of our flasks permanent. And in Kindling, orbs are very balanced. With a 25% increased effect prefix on all of our flasks, this means we get 90% increased effect on every single one of them, allowing us to do some very silly things. As for the base of the flasks, there's only three flasks that are absolutely mandatory in this. First, it's silver for permanent onslaught. This gives us a lot of attack speed and a lot of movement speed, which makes the build feel overall a lot better. And it helps us with managing to reach our attack speed breakpoints a little bit easier. Next is a Diamond Flask because this is just generic crit chance. And because it's generic crit chance, not only does this again allow us to hit our breakpoints on Cyclone a lot easier for getting it crit capped, but it also gives us a lot of Forbidden Right crit chance, allowing us to get substantially closer to crit cap on it as it's very difficult to do that. And lastly, we are running a Granite Flask because we are playing Aegis. We do need to have a lot of armor to abuse the Recover ES equal to 2% of armor on block. And this just simply gives us way too much armor to drop. Lastly, you can kind of pick whatever you'd like for your last flask. I have a Quicksilver, but on a lower budget, what I might recommend, because you're going to be struggling on fire resistance and on lightning resistance, is to instead either run a Topaz or a Ruby flask. Ideally, you'd want one of those because they also make you take less damage. Now, I know we are running Dying Sun, but Dying Sun is not going to be up permanently. So we shouldn't count the effect on it as a consistent buff. But if you do want to minimax a little bit more, I would say to get a Topaz Flask to abuse the 20% less lightning damage taken, which would get increased by Flask Effect to around 39% less damage taken. And that would mean you need to put more focus on your Fire Res. But another alternative to all that is running a Bismuth Flask if you simply are just struggling way too hard and getting enough Fire and enough Lightning Resistance. Ideally, you do want to run a Quicksilver, but Bismuth, Topaz, and Ruby are also good options as alternative flasks for a lower budget. Moving on to the suffixes, there are going to be three suffixes, which I would say are basically mandatory. And then we have one open suffix for you to do whatever you'd like with. The first main suffix that we need is a 25% reduced mana cost of skills during effect roll. This is affected by the flask effect, which means it's realistically 49% reduced mana cost of skills. In the non Mage Blood version of this build, we have to run a minus non-channeling amulets, as well as two minus non-channeling rings, a boot enchant for reduced mana cost of skills, a militant faith for reduced mana cost of skills, and a watcher's eye for non-channeling mana cost of skills. It's a lot of requirements to be able to make Forbidden Rite basically be free. I know in some builds as well, they also opted to pick up Mind Drinker and run the 10% reduced mana cost of skills here. But with the roll on our flasks being permanent and being substantially stronger, we can completely drop the roll on Watcher's Eye, being able to instead focus on better rolls, such as getting a ES on hit Watcher's Eye if you don't already have one, or being able to get other comfy defensive stats, such as reduced extra damage from crits, which in my opinion is an amazing stat that is very difficult to not want to fit into every build. There's also the elemental resistance roll. Now, we are going to need this no matter what, but you might also need a bismuth, ruby, or topaz flask on top of it. But what this allows us to do is it allows us to eventually fit in a melding of the flesh. Now, what this jewel does is it reduces all of our resistances and it reduces our maximum resistances, but it makes it so whatever our highest resistance maximum is, all of our other resistances will mimic it. So if I have 80% max cold res, but my maximum fire and a maximum lightning is only 75, they will now also be 80 provided I can raise them up to 80. Because this has minus 70 all res on it, 
it's basically impossible to fit this into a build without Mage Blood because we cannot consistently rely on having the effectively 78% additional elemental resistances that this gives us with all the flask effect on it with the Mage Blood. With a Crucible Tree on a Aegis this season for plus four maximum cold res, as well as the plus five maximum cold res an Aegis itself gives, this means we can get plus nine maximum cold res just from an Aegis alone. When we combine that with a Purity of Ice for another plus five maximum cold res, we can get very close to 90% all res, and that makes us basically immortal and unkillable. This gives us an insane amount of EHP, and it's honestly the main attraction of going Mage Blood, being able to run a melding and just basically be immortal to all elemental damage. Lastly, the other role that is basically mandatory on a flask is the percent armor role. This is going to make our armor go even higher, which makes our Aegis even better, and it gives us more physical damage reduction. It's honestly basically unskippable, and we can't really pick anything else. For the fourth suffix, you can honestly pick whatever you'd like. I personally like to run movement speed, but some other good options is to pick up 55% reduced chance to avoid stuns. Because of all the flask effect, that effectively turns into 100% chance to avoid being stuns, which makes you immune to stuns if you choose to keep a skin of the loyal and not go with skin of the lords with unwavering stance on it. But another good option as well is to run a 3% life regen flask, which is something you would have to benchcraft yourself on. And if you combine that with Zealot's Oath, you would get about 500 total regen. Currently, we have about 200 regen by default in the build, which doesn't really make Zealot's Oath too attractive. But with another 300 or so from the flask, Zealot's Oath would be about 500 regen for one passive point, making it a very, very attractive one passive point, especially if you are okay just dropping a point somewhere, or if you eventually would get a one passive voice in this build. The other thing to mention about Mage Blood is because we have such an expensive build, we can now look at getting something that most people really just ignore and don't really even know about. There is a version of Lab called Uber Lab, and there are four versions of it, but the version we care about is the dedication version. What this allows us to do is it allows us to put an enchant on our belts. Now, if we go look at the built enchants, most of them aren't really very good. All of them have a condition. For example, armor when fortified, recover life on rage, evasion rating while you're phasing, and so on and so forth. They're all pretty conditional. They're all kind of hard to work with. But there is one that not only is insane, but two perfectly fits into our build. And that is enemies withered by you have minus six to all resistances. Now, this minus six also applies to chaos resistance, meaning everything around us is going to permanently have minus six chaos resistance. We are withering stepping, which is going to allow us to wither things, but we also just by default wither everything around us every single second, effectively making this enchant a permanent uptime. Now, this is more of a super, super high end min max, and it's not something you should immediately go for. And it's kind of difficult to do, because you can either have to trust a lab runner with your mage blood, which I personally would not do, or you have to run it yourself, which takes a while. Personally, I've done this basically every season, and I would say it takes me around three to four hours to get this on my own, and it costs about three to four div. But this is about a 6% DPS increase, and for a few hours of work, it's honestly kind of worth it. And it kind of makes running lab kind of fun, especially when you know for very little work, you actually get a pretty big upgrade out of it. But again, it's a pretty high-end min-max and it's not something I would immediately rush for. It's just something I wanted to make you aware of, especially since this is very much worth actually putting onto a mage blood. Moving on to the rest of the changes. The other main change is going to be related to our passive tree. The first things first is we are fitting in voices now and we are dropping our large cluster jewels. Now, if you are on a lower budget, there is going to be an alternative to this, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But we want to swap over to voices from the large cluster jewels to allow us to fit more jewels into our build and to allow us to fit more auras and to allow us to gain more damage overall. Now, for the voices, I am going with three passive voices here. These are about 30 div each. You can go with five passive voices, and under no circumstance are you going to ever run a three a seven passive voices, those are just simply not worth your time. And at seven passives, you might as well just keep your large cluster jewels instead of swapping over to voices. But the main attraction here is going to be we are going to get six jewel slots in total versus just the four that we have with large passive jewels. Because in this build, we want to fit a few more auras and we want to not go over here to the right anymore. 
one, we lose a jewel socket, but this is still overall one more jewel socket compared to the other way of putting this build around. With this, we are able to not only get a lot more crit chance, which is important, getting Cyclone crit capped is not really that difficult. It's a pretty easy feat to do. But the difficult part is getting our Forbidden Right crit capped. And because of this, we want to add in more crit clusters and Voices allows us to do that while also being able to get more resistances. Because again, we do need to struggle with melding. And the only real way to fit more resistances in this build, because we have so many unique items, is to fit in more cluster jewels and to get more resistances on said cluster jewels. With a Mage Blood, we are able to drop basically all of the attack speed out of our build because Onslaught is just so powerful. And with just one quick getaway and with two repeaters, we are able to hit basically exactly trigger rate, which is honestly amazing and makes it so we don't need to waste so much space on attack speed. The rest of these clusters are all going to be eye to eye because eye to eye is simply just really, really powerful as well as one Shrieking Bolts since it is a decent node to have on here and is the next best thing when we don't need repeater. As for the other cluster jewels, we are going to go for pressure points, basics of pain, because these are simply just the two best options for crit clusters. In three of our cluster jewels, we are going to be fitting in melding, our watcher's eye, and a corrupted blood jewel. Now you could instead get this on, for example, a thread of hope or on a melding or somewhere else, but that's going to be ridiculously expensive. So realistically, one of our jewels is going to have to be a rare jewel to get corrupted blood. Here we can put a little bit of crit multi, some energy shield, some resistances if you need some resistances. This is a pretty flexible slot. So feel free to get whatever you want on this that allows you to fill in the rest of your stats. Because we don't need a reduced mana cost clarity watch's eye anywhere, we can now get a discipline ES on hit watch's eye and we can get a second roll on there that is kind of nice. Now, what you can go for is up to you. You can pick basically anything you want for a second roll. But personally, because I feel like this stat is undervalued by 90% of the community and a lot of people don't understand how powerful it is, I always typically go with reduced extra damage from crits while affected by determination on basically every watch's eye and every single build that I play that runs determination. Having reduced extra damage from crits is such a powerful stat that I would basically give up anything for it. Being at least somewhat immune to crits or even just having 50% less damage from crits stops so many of the one shots that you normally experience. And if you have an immortal build that just sometimes randomly dies, those sometimes random deaths are most likely crits. And having even just a little bit of crit reduction just makes you feel a lot tankier and it makes all the random spiky damage not feel as impactful. As for the other three clusters, we are going to be fitting in three 6% increased mana reservation efficiency of skills, three passive small jewel sockets. Now on all of three of these, they have one important stat that you cannot skip on. That is the 35% increase effect of small passive skills. What this does is it's going to turn the 6% mana reservation efficiency into 8%. If you get 25% increased effect, that is not going to be enough. That is simply going to turn it into 7%. We need 35% increased to get 8%. As you can see, we are very, very tight on mana. And if these are not all 8% instead of 7%, you're not going to be able to fit everything in. Now, Path of Building doesn't actually show this. It still shows it as 6%, but if you were to go in game and equip one of these, it would actually show as 8%. The other nice thing about this is because this build is going to be very strength and dexterity starved, as well as very resistance starved, we can get other really nice resistance or attribute rolls on these, and they'll also be increased by 35% increased effect, making reaching our breakpoints a lot easier. On all of the jewels, just as before, you are trying to get as many resistances and as many attributes as you can. You're trying to fit these everywhere you can. Seven decks, seven fire res, eight decks, five cold res, eight decks for all res, and so on and so forth. You basically need to find dexterity, strength, and resistances everywhere you can, and especially so on the small clusters because these are going to be the most impactful. Now, if you are good on your resistances, then you can instead choose to add intelligence and flat ES on these instead. And these are going to balloon your ES a lot higher, which is going to make you feel a lot tankier. And that is really the only thing we can improve about our EHB in this build. We're effectively immortal. And the only time we'll ever die is to just random big hits. And the only way to make those random big hits not as impactful is to just simply get more ES. The build feels pretty good around 5k ES, but if you get to around 6, 7, and even 8k with absolutely insane, like perfect clusters, you can just AFK 
every Uber ability if it happened at the same time. It becomes it becomes like ridiculously tanky. It's really important to go shop for very good clusters. So take your time when you are shopping for these and find very, very, very good ones. Moving on, there are some other changes that we need to make to our build as well. So let's talk about the gear next. First off being ashes. We do not need to fit in a minus mana cost amulet anymore. And ashes is going to basically beat absolutely everything else that we can fit in here. One thing I will recommend on a lower budget, if you cannot find good clusters or if you do not have the money for good clusters, is to instead pick up the mana mastery again and pick up the mana reservation here, drop one of the cluster jewels completely, and instead anoint charisma onto your amulet instead of infused. We are anointing infused to not have to path all the way out here to save ourselves quite a lot of passive points, which we can put into cluster jewels. But if you need more mana, if you do not have enough mana, then you will need to pick up charisma. You will need to pick up the mastery again. And then you can eventually drop these later once you have more money to be able to fit in all of your clusters. But the reason we're running ashes is not only the 20% reservation efficiency it gives, we absolutely need that to be able to fit everything in, but it also gives us 20% quality of all skill gems. This is really nice because this allows us to then run a divergent tempest shield. And what the divergent effect does is 2% spell block. This is increased to 4% because it's going to be 40% quality. And then that 4% is going to be doubled to 8% because of glancing blows. This means that because of that, we do not need to pick up this spell block node right here, giving us one passive point back as this is the same exact thing. Not only that, but there are quite a lot of alt quality jewels that we can get that make our build substantially more powerful and substantially stronger. And because of that, Ashes is really strong. When you are shopping for an Ashes, make sure you look for 20% reservation efficiency. The quality doesn't really matter. A 20% quality, a bottom roll is more than good enough as that will save us the one passive point. And if you do want to get a best in slot Ashes, it really doesn't actually do much. If we look at a 30% Ashes instead, it's only about a 2% DPS increase and it's only a slight movement speed increase. It's not really that important and it's not as important as the reservation roll. Other than that, we are going to look to upgrade our skin of the loyal. Now, before in the non mageable version, we we're using a plus one maximum loyal and you can keep using that if you like to be a little bit tankier. But if you want more damage, we're going to be looking for a plus two socketed AOE, a plus two socketed projectiles, or a plus one socketed gems skin of the loyal. Or you can swap over to a skin of the lords instead with an wavering stance. This alone, just plus two socketed AOE, is going to give us about a 15% DPS increase, which is a pretty massive upgrade. You can either choose to just keep what you have or upgrade to this. I would probably just upgrade to this as plus one max all res, especially if you go and get yourself a plus four Aegis. It's not really going to be that noticeable and certainly not as noticeable as at and certainly not as noticeable as a 15% DPS increase. Lastly, I do have a Calandra's touch in here. And this is simply just a way for me to say, hey, you just need to get two of these rings. But these are just the same generic rings as the non mage blood version. You just simply want to, if you have a weaker ring, look for something substantially more powerful. Look for something with more resistances on it. Look for something with strength and dexterity. Look for something that has substantially higher rolls because you are going to struggle with the strength and dex rolls on this build. And that is about it for the absolute basic setup. The TLDR is mostly just put on your Magewood flasks, figure out how to get enough resistances to be able to fit in melding, and then basically become a super tank. Outside of some other things, such as, for example, if you don't have a enchant and plus one power charge on your helmet, you should probably go get one that has both. There really isn't much else you can change for this build. And this is basically the most min max you can make it on a super, super low budget. And what I mean by that is maybe Mage Blood plus 100 ish div or so, or maybe Mage Blood plus 200 ish div or so. Next up, I want to show you how to take this build and scale it to the absolute moon because we can go further. It's just if you aren't looking towards a very expensive item slash mirror tier items. This is realistically how far you'll be able to push this. So the first thing to mention on how to take this build to the moon and on how you would upgrade this even further would to go get yourself a plus one power charge implicit ring. These, as you can see, are extremely expensive. And that is why I have not mentioned these until the end of the video, because for most people, you most likely are not going to get to the point where you get this. 
slash you're only going to realistically be looking for one of these once you've gone through basically everything I've said. But even if we were just to take this one right here, just the cheapest one on the market, and we added it in with a Calandra Touch, this is where you would want to actually go and get the Calandra Touch because while this is only 50, 60 div, it does give you a copy of this. So you save yourself around 50 to 60 div. And later on, once we get into mirror tier items, well, it's gonna save you over a mirror. So if we just simply were to add a plus one power charge ring into here, as you can see, we would immediately gain 20% increased damage. Now, these are kind of all over the place. These are typically not very good, and you most likely will have to craft it yourself. And if you're going to do that, you would just want to buy the cheapest one and go from there. But the additional plus one power charge is going to give you a stupid amount of added damage. This would be the first big endgame upgrade you would go for, and it would skyrocket your damage into the moon. Outside of this, the only real thing that we can do that's super expensive is looking at mirror tier items. So there are three major mirror tier items for this build. There are technically four with boots, but the absolute best boots you can make for this build cost less than a mirror to actually make. So I wouldn't really consider them mirror tier, but we have a weapon, we have a helmet and we have a ring. So the first thing I would recommend if you were to actually mirror something for this build would be to mirror the ring. Not only do you get two copies of it because of Calandra's touch, but in my opinion, it's also the biggest upgrade. As we can see with the current best ring for this build, which is a plus one power charge, crit multi, and spell damage per power charge ring, you would be gaining around 30% extra DPS from being able to run it. And this is just per ring. If we add in Calandra's Touch, as you can see, this basically doubles your damage because you would get two effective rings out of this. This ring would also completely solve your strength issues. And this would allow you to only have to focus on dexterity on all of your cluster jewels. The other item which I would recommend if you wanted to mirror something for this build would be to mirror a weapon. Now, there's a few of these in Crucible. A lot of people have decided to copy this, but the weapon, in my opinion, is probably the most fun part of this build. This is a spells deal double damage crit multi weapon with a really, really insane tree on it. Now, the one in this path of building is going to have the portions of the tree, which Path of Building doesn't immediately like to show, added on as stats, simply for the sake of being able to show the actual full DPS that the item would give you in one nice stat at the bottom of the whole thing. So what this is, is a plus one chaos weapon, which you would make if you followed the weapon crafting guide. That also has spells deal double damage on it, and has Rampage on it as a Crucible Tree. This stagger basically doubles your damage. Not only does it give you more crit chance, but it will also basically crit cap Forbidden Right. And that is because of the fifth node that we put on it, which is Consecrated Path and Purifying Flame create Profane Ground instead of Consecrated Ground. Now, what Profane Ground does is it reduces all resistances by 10%, which is why this weapon has enemies withered, have minus 10 all res on it. It's the easiest way to stimulate that. And it also gives you 100% increased critical strike chance against enemies on consecrated ground. Because you are self-hitting yourself and because we are running an ashes, we are able to proc a vengeance around five times per second. And because of all the AOE that we have from Forbidden Power, our purifying grounds are actually very big and we can do five of them per second, allowing us to have 100% uptime on purifying flame and 100% uptime on consecrated ground, making us benefit from the profane ground everywhere, as well as this weapon has rampage on it. And if you've never played with rampage, oh my God, rampage is amazing. Rampage is about 60% increased movement speed and it's about 10% increased damage when clearing. As you can see, just between the ring and the dagger, we immediately go to 82 million DPS. It gets kind of crazy. The last item to mention, if you were looking for mirror tier items, would be upgrading from a crown that is plus one power charge and plus one projectile to a hubris instead that is also forbidden right, plus one projectile and plus one power charge. The added benefit of this is it also has aura effect on it and it has a lot of ES making you substantially tankier. This effectively increases your EHP by 30%, while also giving you a little bit of extra DPS and a little bit of extra reservation because you'll be able to put your auras in this and you'll be able to put a Enlighten in here 
making it a very, very high level lane, as well as making all the auras in it very, very strong. With all these put together, we can hit 83 million DPS, which basically 2.5x is the build. And there's no real other way of getting up to this level without using mirror tier items. Even with that said, putting together everything else and having a build that is around 40-ish million DPS with a little bit more min-maxing without adding in the mirror items is still a very, very strong build. And it's still enough to basically do all content instantly. But I did want to show people some options for mirror tier items and how you can push this build to absolutely laughable amounts of DPS with some more money. That's all I have to say on this. I hope this was useful to you guys. And I hope this answered all your questions on how to upgrade this build into a mage build build. If you have any more questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments or feel free to come ask me on Twitch. I'll be more than happy to help you and to answer any questions you have. Other than that, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you guys in the next video.